Hello and welcome to this episode of Fantasy Baseball Picks and Bets presented by Prize Picks on the Mayo Media Network. I am Gary and Thorne. It is Friday night. It might be Saturday morning when you are watching this. Either way, you know what's happening. We are talking everything you need to know to play some fantasy baseball on Saturday, May 29th. For DraftKings purposes, we're going to be focusing mostly on the five-game featured slate, which kicks off past 7.15 p.m. on the East Coast. However, I would be remiss if I did not let you know there's also a 10-game featured slate taking place throughout the afternoon. So partake in that if you will. I'm not going to stop you. Another way to get in on the afternoon baseball action would be by heading over to prizepicks.com using the promo code MMNMLB and then getting your first deposit matched up to $100 when you use said promo code. Actually, both of the prize picks I like for Saturday's slate are taking place in that early window. And we start with the first game of the day, that being the Colorado Rockies visiting the Pittsburgh Pirates, which is important, obviously, because there's no altitude in Pittsburgh. Well, there's altitude, but it's not the altitude of... You know what I mean. We don't have to get into this whole thing. Anyway, let's talk about Brian Reynolds, who's actually having a pretty good season. Uh, Had a 140 WRC plus heading into action on Friday. This guy's no slouch. However... His fantasy point prop is set at five and a half going up against John Gray. And John Gray has had a really good season so far for the Rockies. Specifically, he's had a lot of success mitigating the effect of right-handed batters, opposing right-handed batters. He has held righties to just a 263 Woba so far this season. And Reynolds, for as good as he's been so far in 2021... A lot of that success has come against left-handed pitching. Uh, He has a 294 isolated power against Southpaws so far this season. That ISO drops to just 133 against right-handed pitching. So he still has some power in right-on-right situations, but he's nowhere near the hitter, or he's, he's not been anywhere close to the same type of hitter so far this season when he's right on right versus right on left. So I like Reynolds to go under five and a half fantasy points. That's going to be a low scoring game in general. Kind of the same vibe we saw with the Colorado Mets series uh, just earlier in the week. The other prop I like in the afternoon, Reese Hoskins to go over six and a half fantasy points. Uh, Philly is going up against Tampa Bay. Generally speaking, that means some good pitching from the Tampa side. And while Ryan Yarborough is a very good pitcher, uh, definitely better than you would think if you were to just kind of hear what his arsenal is, uh, he's still a left-handed pitcher. And I think Reese Hoskins will be able to take advantage of that fact considering he has crushed lefties so far this season. In fact, a 438 Woba in a 180 WRC plus within the split so far in 2021. And just in general, in the month of May, Hoskins has been on fire. He has a 150 WRC plus within the month. So he has really heated up as the calendar has turned from April to May. Let's take advantage of that fact. I think he's going over six and a half fantasy points on Saturday. So Hoskins over six and a half, Reynolds under 5.5. Now let us talk about that five game featured slate over on DraftKings. Again, that gets going at 7.15 p.m. Eastern time. Already have to put an asterisk on the five game thing. There were four different games rained out on Friday, two more, uh, one in Cleveland, one in Boston, that had serious delays during the game. Tons of rain right now on the East Coast in the Northeast region. So tomorrow's game, Saturday's game, between Milwaukee and Washington is the second leg of a doubleheader on Saturday. So only, you know, seven innings in that game. That obviously changes your perspective a little bit on how you attack that game, particularly from an offensive perspective. Uh, I think generally speaking, uh, it's Brett Anderson up against Patrick Corbin. Those are the expected pitchers in that contest. You would be okay to stack against both. Um, Particularly Washington has some nice bats to go up against Brett Anderson. However, seven inning game, you might only get three plate appearances. You might only get like two at bats if someone walks. 
it's a little bit of a tougher environment. So I did want to make sure I pointed that out when talking about this five-game slate. Uh, let's start at the top when it comes to pitching because there are two pitchers on this slate who are far and away the best pitching options, and unfortunately, they are the two highest price options on Saturday night. We've got Julio Urias going up against the San Francisco Giants. It'll be a second straight start against the Giants, and the Giants aren't actually that bad against left-handed pitching, but Urias made them look pretty bad this past Sunday when he did face them last. Six innings in that game, just two earned runs and 10 strikeouts. And that's really the thing with Urias that's been different so far this season. He's got roughly a 30% strikeout rate, which was just not something we had ever seen from this guy. In the past, he scored 28 DraftKings points in four of his past five starts. And that almost justifies right there the $10,000 price tag. It's a hefty price tag, don't get me wrong, but that's the output he has had so far this season. He's generally been worth a five-digit price tag. I mean, look at the numbers among qualified pitchers. He's got a 2.82 FIP. That is the 11th best mark in all of baseball. He's got a .82 whip. That is the fifth best mark in all of baseball. And he's striking out 10 opponents per walk. That is the third best mark in all of baseball. And the only two pitchers better than Julio Urias coming into Friday's slate in strikeout-to-walk ratio were Jacob DeGrom and Garrett Cole. Some pretty good company. That's some pretty damn good company. So I think Urias, even in a matchup that I wouldn't describe as fantastic, uh, I think Urias's high floor and then the high ceiling now added due to the fact that this strikeout rate has really blossomed. I, I wouldn't say out of nowhere, but it, it by far a career high strikeout rate through two months of the season. So I will buy into that. Then you've got Ian Anderson, who's a very similar type of pitcher, not someone who you would generally um, look at and say that is an elite strikeout pitcher, although he's got a 25 to 26% strikeout rate for the season. That's perfectly fine. It's slightly above average in 2021. Anderson is $9,400. He's only allowed one earned run across his past two starts. That is a span of 12 innings. Uh, but still, the real key, the real enticing aspect of this start for Ian Anderson is that it's against the Mets and the Mets the last two weeks, I mean, through really no fault of their own. um, I think every player who was in their opening day starting lineup, who isn't Francisco Lindor, who's in a heck of a slump right now has been on the IL or is currently on the IL. They are so injured and the lineups they are putting out are kind of hilariously sad. Uh, They've got, like, Brandon Drury and Billy McKinney batting cleanup. James McCann, who's not been good this season, is hitting third and playing first base. Like, it's bad right now. And their numbers across the last two weeks, they're hitting 191 as a team, just a 66 WRC plus and a 27.3% strikeout rate. I would maybe be viable against the Mets right now. Um, That's just really how bad they've been. And Anderson for the season, 2.82 ERA. 3.26 3.26 xFIP over 51 innings. He's also got a 56% ground ball rate, and this is really what he does the best, almost better than anyone else in baseball. He negates launch angle. Opponents are averaging just one degree on their launch angle against Ian Anderson so far this season. That is the second lowest average launch angle among qualified pitchers. So he really just doesn't give up those optimum launch angle statistics, which lead to barrels, which lead to home runs. Um, He's he's able to induce a lot of ground balls, and and that really helps Ian Anderson. I don't think the Mets are going to be able to do much against him in this game. So I would honestly say I will have lineups where I just bite the bullet and use Urias and use Anderson and figure it out with the bats, because I do think there are some cheaper stacking options. We'll get into those in just a second. Um, But if you do want to get a little creative, there's a tier of pitcher. Uh, It includes Justin Dunn, Mike fulton and Patrick Corbin. And I mentioned that Washington-Milwaukee game. I worry less about the pitchers in a seven-inning game because so few pitchers even work into the eighth at this point that it doesn't really matter all that much. And in fact, you kind of remove some of the middle-inning relievers You get right to the back end of the bullpen, and it helps the win expectancy a little bit. Um, These three guys are not good, but one of them is going to have a game that defines this slate, and I think it's going to be Justin Dunn going up against the Texas Rangers. Uh, Dunn's actually been pretty good in the month of May. 2.79 ERA, 
Uh, he's striking out 9.8 batters per nine innings in that span of time, which his strikeout rate isn't nearly as good because he walks so many guys that it kind of waters down the numbers, but he has strikeout stuff. He's got a sub three ERA in the month. And he's going up against a Rangers team that's hitting 216 with an 87 WRC plus the past two weeks. So do I think Justin Zun's going to score 30 DraftKings points? No. But at $7,000, if he can score 20, perfectly acceptable. And I think the Mariners are going to get to Mike Fultonavich. So I think Justin Dunn's win expectancy is relatively high, at least for a Seattle Mariners pitcher on any given night. Uh, Fultonavich has given up a 435 Woba to left-handed bats so far this season. No qualified pitcher in the American League has a worse number within the split. So Fultonavich is someone who I was sort of looking at early in my analysis thinking, okay, some strikeout potential. He's going up against Seattle. Seattle's a, you know, bad offensive team. Uh, You only, once you're no-hit twice, I think we're allowed to lump you into the category of bad offensive teams. However, the one thing Seattle does have is the ability to throw a lot of left-handed bats at a particular pitcher. Um, They can throw as many as five or six with the options they currently have on their 26-man roster. And three of those five or six are three of their best hitters and guys who are hitting towards the top of the order, that being Jared Kelnick, Kyle Seager, and J.P. Crawford. So it just isn't a great spot. If if there were more right-handed bats in the Seattle lineup, I might even suggest using Fultonavich because the splits are that drastic. He's actually been above average right on right, but he's terrible left on left, and it's been dragging down his stats. Again, so many home runs, 435 Woba. So when I talk about the viability of Urias and Anderson and possibly building lineups with those two guys as your SP1, SP2, the way you can sort of circumvent that and actually get some decent bats into your lineup Seattle, you've got Kyle Seager at 4,100. Coming into Friday, Seager had the sixth highest barrels per plate appearance rate in baseball. Kind of, I believe he was directly in between Aaron Judge and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., which is not the sort of company you think of when you think about Kyle Seager, but that's what he's done so far this season. So $4,100 against a guy who can't get out lefties, that's a really nice price for Seager. Yes, Kelnick hasn't hit yet. He's only got two home runs. He's hitting below 150. It's not great. However, he's still hitting leadoff, and he's still left-handed, and he's still got a ton of potential. So I think this matchup against Voltanevich suits him really well. He's just 3,700. And Crawford, who generally hits fifth or sixth in Seattle's lineup when they're facing a right-handed pitcher, he is just $3,000. Use Mitch Hanniger. Use Kyle Lewis as well. Both also pretty moderately priced, but I'd like to get all three of those left-handed bats into a lineup against Mike Fultonavich and their low price points make using Urias and Anderson together a possible, a viable solution to the lack of pitching on this particular slate. Okay, before we get out of here, let's talk about some best bets on Saturday's slate. Want to start with the game between the Yankees and the Tigers. This is going to sound strange, but I love the under, love the under in this game. Um, obviously the Tigers are not a great offense. I think we all know that. The pitching matchup is not one that would like make you stop in your tracks about how amazing it is either. It's Davey Garcia, high, high end prospect, but someone who has not pitched well in AAA so far this season, uh, against Spencer Turnbull. But I don't think people give Spencer Turnbull enough credit. So far this season, Turnbull has a 2.89 expected ERA across his seven starts. He's been easily the best starter in the Tigers rotation. And Garcia... Like, again, it's not been great so far this season, but I just don't trust the Tigers. Um, And the reason for that is, in the month of May, the Tigers have the worst isolated power in the American League at just 113. The team in 14th place, last place aside from the Tigers, is the New York Yankees at just 129. They have not been hitting so far this season. They've been entirely carried by their pitching and their bullpen. And that's the thing. If Garcia gets through five innings, and even if he allows three runs— I trust that Yankees bullpen to lock it down from that point forward. I don't think the Tigers can score many runs. And I think the Yankees are going to have trouble scoring runs off of Turnbull, who, again, has been really good so far this season. The other bet I like, Toronto Blue Jays to go over four and a half runs against Sam Henges and Cleveland. 
Uh, that is minus 110. I should mention that Yankees, Tigers, under. Uh, that is eight and a half runs. It's minus 106 on the DraftKings Sportsbook. Okay, back to the Blue Jays. Up against Sam Henges. Henges so far this season, 6.39 expected ERA. And in the month of May, entering play on Friday, the Blue Jays had the highest slugging percentage in baseball at 462. That was, again, before they scored 11 runs in seven innings against Cleveland. And that's the thing. You've got Henges, who's only started three games so far this season of his seven appearances. You've got a bullpen that's already taxed because Eli, what was his name? Eli Morgan, I believe, was only able to go two and a third innings on Friday. There's just not a lot working in the favor of Cleveland right now. The Jays' bats are incredibly hot, and this is a, this is a lineup chock full of right-handed bats. All their best hitters are right-handed, whether it's Marcus Semien, Bo Bichette, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Tasker Hernandez, Randall Gritchik, on and on and on. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is really heating up as well, has always hit left-handed pitching well. If I'm Sam Henges, I'm not liking the fact that I'm left-handed going up against this Blue Jays lineup. So I think the Jays easily clear this number at 4.5 at minus 110. Uh, I like that. I like the Yankees-Tigers under even more at minus 106. And that's going to do it for this episode of Fantasy Baseball Picks and Bets on the Mayo Media Network. Make sure to check out all the great content on the Mayo Media Network. Any sport you could possibly imagine, Pat's got you covered in some way. Guys, thanks so much for watching this episode of the show, brought to you by Prize Picks. I'm Gary and Thorne. I'll catch you later.